Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all so much for being here. Please feel free to keep on eating breakfast or go back for seconds <laughs> if you'd like. My name is Diane Ford, and I'm the Assistant Director for the Center for Healthcare Management and Policy at the Paul Mirage School of Business. I would like to thank our speakers here today for volunteering their time to share their expertise and knowledge on the topic today of social determinants of health. You can find their bios on the table, and we also have extra copies on the registration table on your way out if you'd like to get one. The program is being recorded today and will be made available on the Mirage website should you like to refer back to it or if you would like to share with a colleague who could not be here with us today. I would love to hear your feedback. Please feel free to email me and share any comments you have regarding the program, or if you have any topics you would like to suggest for future programming, I'm all ears, so please share. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce our moderator, Ramla Batra. She is a Mirage alum, a Mirage faculty, and we can thank her for being here today because she helped put this um, event and topic and speakers all together. So please help me welcome Ramala. Thank you, Ramala. Thanks, Diane, and good morning, everyone. It's very nice to see a whole host of people. Some of you I know very well, and it's always great to meet others as well. Um, what Diane left behind about me is I'm also the Chief Medical Officer of Scan Health Plan, so yes, I have a full-time job as well. Um, so our goal today is to kind of um, shed light on what's happening in the space of social determinants of health. Many of us have been talking about it. It's the latest buzzword, as we say, but I, I wanted for us to organize a panel where we can see from a payer perspective, a hospital perspective, a community-based health organization perspective, and a county-based organization perspective, how are we addressing uh, social determinants of health? And also to kind of highlight what policy changes have happened in the last year or so that have let us address them in more wholesome way. Before I get started, I wanted to quickly go uh, around and introduce our very esteemed panel that is sitting right next to me. And what I'm going to ask them to do is introduce themselves, give a little bit of bi uh, background and, on their own organizations and the role that they play there. So I'll start with you, Naseem. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here with you all today. I'm Naseem Afsar. I'm the Chief Ambulatory Officer at UC Irvine Health. I also oversee our contracting and our population health programs um, at UCI Health. I'm a physician by training. I'm an internist and a hospitalist. Um, I think you all know UCI Health well. Um, maybe some parts that I can share with you that are new in terms of the, our vision for the future is we have really shifted our focus to uh, looking at value-based care and population health management and what we need to do to get there. That starts by making sure that we have uh, the services that our patients need in the communities where they live and function. So we are undergoing a rapid ambulatory expansion. Uh, we realize that healthcare is no longer delivered in brick and mortar, so we're looking robustly at telehealth technologies that can help serve our patients. And we've got a couple of other exciting things in stock that we hope uh, to share with you in the near future. Thank you, and go to David next. Yep. Hi, good morning. I'm David Ramirez. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at CalOptima. CalOptima is the Medi-Cal managed care plan for Orange County. Um, so we have 750,000 members or so. Every individual in Orange County who has Medi-Cal becomes a CalOptima member. So we have a great responsibility to manage the health care of that population. Um, we also, I work with a great team. I'm over the clinical programs, uh, clinical medical affairs for the plan. Um, we per have a particular um, initiative around homeless health care. Our board recently approved an allocation of $100 million over the next few years to focus on um, health care for the homeless. So that's a huge initiative. We're doing a lot as well in behavioral health, uh, integrating uh, and improving access to the behavioral health care in the county as well. So um, social determinants of health are definitely very important in, to us as we try to manage these uh, 
our population better. And um, I look forward to uh, interacting and engaging with you and hearing more from the rest of the panel. Thanks. Thank you. Paul? Um, good morning. My name is Paul Leon. I'm actually a public health nurse. And um, we actually started Illumination Foundation, of which I am a CEO, in uh, MBA class in the HIC mm -hmm. And Romilla was actually in our class um, as a class project. And you'll see it's grown quite a bit. But for the last 15 years, um, I've been working with homeless in Orange County and worked with the healthcare agency for a few years um, prior to starting Illumination Foundation. And we actually developed recuperative care here in Orange County. Um, it ended up becoming now the largest recuperative care in the nation. Uh, we have a, a nightly census of 200 individuals and so I look forward to sharing with you some of the things that worked and some of the things that didn't work. Um, social determinants of health, um, we started that about 10 years ago. Um, we didn't really know what it was called, but basically it was mm -hmm. social determinants of health. I always tell people we're kind of innovative, but it more or less found us. We, we weren't innovative, so I'm glad to be here this morning. Wonderful, thank you. So the format we'll follow is I've asked all the speakers to kind of go over their own perspective, their organization's perspective around social determinants of health, their areas of focus, some programs they have done, and also to kind of make it more tactical around how are they going to evaluate these programs? How are we going to address the quadruple aim that all of us have been looking forward to? So with that, I'm going to kick off and share our SCAN Health Plan's perspective on social determinants of health, and then we'll have uh, Nassim do it, and we'll go from there. So how many of you have heard about SCAN? Show of hands. Oh, great. It's always heartwarming to see so many hands. Well, uh, we are a 40-plus-year-old organization, a not-for-profit health plan, which was actually started by 12 angry seniors. No, it's not a myth. It's a real thing. And the reason it was founded was those angry seniors felt that medical care in itself will not keep them healthy and independent in their homes. They did not want to end in nursing homes, and so they wanted social wrap around care so they could age in place, and that's how, we, that's how we were founded. So fast forward to that, we started with the first state, uh, not the first state, in 1979, we started the uh, MSSP contract. This is not the Medicare Shared Saving Programs. This is the multi-purpose senior program that offers help to folks who are um, in their homes to age in place. We then had a social HMO contract with Medicare, which was the longest serving pilot in the Medicare history. And unfortunately, we had to unwind the pilot. Fast forward to now, we are in 2019. We are the second largest not-for-profit MAPD plan. We are third largest in California. We have about 205,000 lives. And the biggest thing is we run our own community-based organization. So we understand the needs that the community has. When we started taking this approach of social determinants of health, we wanted to have, we wanted to see where can we make a difference. You know, we are small but mighty, but we wanted to use our resources well and make, make sure we can make an impact. And so this is a very good graphic from Health Affairs that we totally zoned in on and said, yes, we have to make an impact upstream, we have to make an impact midstream, and we have to make an impact downstream. Upstream for us is serving the community at large through our community-based organization and also helping inform policy at the state level and at the federal level so we can have a landscape where we can offer these resources. Midstream for us is through the health plan membership that we touch through our case management programs and so on and so forth. And downstream is a provider delivery system which does this amazing jobs. But I, being a primary care physician, can tell you nobody trained me in how to address homelessness, what to do for a patient who shows up and says, I don't have food or I can't get a ride. So how can we help enhance our delivery system, teach them best practices? And that's how we kind of see ourselves playing a role in social determinants of health. The next thing we did was we then looked at our own profile, our own personas, and said, what do our people look like? They all are not similar. And based on the medical data we had on them, and I know we were talking to some experienced folks, we just had medical data, we kind of created personas. We call them Linda, Steadies, and Sandies. So as you can see, Sandies are our frailer personas, have more chronic conditions. You also notice there are more admissions, there are more ER visits, their quality of care perhaps is not getting to where they would want it to be. However, we wanted to enhance that, and so what we did last year is we started doing something called the social HRA, which is based on PREPARE, which is a validated tool where we started asking people around their housing needs, whether they had transportation needs, 
Was it easy or okay to access food? Did they live alone? What other problems did they have with toileting, bathing, things that make you age in place? And we were surprised because we are MAPD plan and we do offer a lot of zero dollar stuff that we still had a sizable population that said, I have difficulty accessing food, accessing transportation, or even managing my own medication. And that was a telling tale for us to focus on. What we further did was to say, okay, just because you're telling me you don't have access to food, does it change your total cost of care? And no surprises there, you know, you, what you notice is it doesn't matter if you are a younger, healthier person or older, frailer person, if you have difficulty with transportation, can't get to the grocery store, or you don't have access to food, or you cannot take your medicines because you don't understand them, your total cost of care as seen by admissions per thousand or ER visits per thousand are way higher than if you did not have those problems. And the reason this is important is, you know, as much as good as we would like to do, there still has to be a business case for us to design these programs and to be able to keep those programs sustainable. So we build, move from what we call, uh, what's, the, what's the matter with you? You know, a lot of physicians will say, what's the matter with you? How come you keep showing up in the ER? To what really matters to you? And I call it person-centered Medicare, because this year, for the first time, Medicare does let us design benefits that were not medical benefits. In the past, we could not design benefits. So even if I knew that this person who is falling and has grab bars in their home, I could not send a plumber to their home or to a handyman to their home to fix the bars because that is not a Medicare covered benefit because that Medicare did not see as medical. But fast forward to today, Medicare now has said, we understand these social needs are the ones that are driving total cost of care reducing quality of care, so you could totally provide those kind of services. So we have started dabbling uh, some stuff in there. So what did we do with the whole uh, approach to our own membership? We have the medical data, the lab data, the claims data, the pharmacy data. We are now rolling in the social data, trying to also get data based on households and zip codes, and creating these personas which are more holistic, and trying to touch and intervene based on what, what they want. So to give you an example, we have a peer-to-peer -peer program. Guess what? When you are a senior and you're diffi having difficulty with incontinence or mental health or falls, you don't want to talk to a 25, 28, 30-year-old nurse. You want to talk to somebody who can relate to you. So we took our own members, we trained them in motivational interviewing, and we deployed them to talk to our own seniors, and lo and behold, we saw a lot of benefit there. So that's just an example of it. So benefits beyond Medicare, you know, if you can see, you know, I'm not going to go over all of them. We offer a rich array of benefits because we understand in order for you to get to your doctor that provides high quality care, you need transportation. In order for you to maintain your physical health, you need access to resources like a gym, perhaps, if you can participate in them. And in order for you to bring down your opioid utilization, perhaps you need acupuncture or chiropractic. So as you can see, we, off we started offering them. But what I am most excited being a primary care physician and also being working in a community-based organization is now we are offering things like uh, food. You get discharged home from your hospital, you get millions of paperwork, you come home, there's nobody to help you out with simple stuff as taking bath, cooking your meal. Guess what? No matter how amazing care you get in any system, you will end up back in the hospital. So what we introduced this year was what we call return to home, where after you get discharged, you get up to food, up to four weeks delivered in your home. You also have a coordinator who's, who will say, Mr. Smith, looks like you need to see a doctor. Do you have a ride? Oh, you don't have a ride. Let me arrange a ride for you. You also get some hours of in-home caregiving. So, you know, somebody will come, make your bed, you know, help you with the bathing and things like that. So very excited to see what happens uh, to that. The next benefit we also introduce is what I call, for those of you who know the capable model, I call it the capable light model, where people who are falling or having difficulty ambulating within their own homes because you know, they have rugs or they don't have bars in their uh, bathrooms, we have now occupational therapists that can go in your home, create your action plan, and then make sure that action plan gets executed on. So you just don't have grab bars sitting in the nice Amazon Prime delivery box on your front door, but there is somebody who will go and install those bars so you don't fall, end up with a hip fracture, and then six-month mortality. So these are, these are the early blush of um, utilizations that we are seeing. You know, we are eight, nine, ten months into it, very new programs. These are not your standard zero-dollar copay where the patients are very used to saying, well, what's my copay? What tier am I on? 
what is my copay for the specialist. So we are still seeing early hitches in adoption, but over the last few months, the adoption of these programs is going up as people are learning about it, our case managers are learning about it and leveraging those programs. And then now that we, can, we are in open enrollment, excited that we took it a step further to challenge ourselves and say, hey, if our social data is showing us people have access to food, why are we limiting it just to people who are in the hospital setting or getting discharged? So this year, which is in 2020, we are introducing a new meal benefit where up to, you can get up to a month of meals if you are a diabetic or if you have end-stage renal disease or if you have congestive heart failure. Because once again, these people just don't, you cannot meet their needs just when they're in the hospital. Perhaps they need more than just being in the hospital. So that's kind of the flavor of things that we are doing. And last but not the least, we also took a step back and said, there's a lot of problem around social isolation and depression and mental health in our population. And when you do the root cause analysis, it's because these people cannot act, have access to others who are like them. They cannot go to the senior center. They cannot go and meet up with the people that they care about beyond the doctors and the pharmacies that we were covering. So we have now introduced a non-medical transportation benefit where they can get a ride to a senior center or a grocery store. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is to say, you know, I can share with you till cows come home about $0 specialist and $0 PCP, which is great and amazing, but there is more to healthcare than just the medical care. And now that we have this uh, policy switch, we are incorporating. Uh, all these things. But the next question for us, uh, which, you know, more than uh, anything else, our CFOs will ask us is, okay, you know, Medicare did allow us to do it, but we never got additional dollars for it. We have to find dollars within our own system to provide for these kind of resources. So guess what? We now have to have design evaluation to say which ones worked, which ones didn't work. And who did it work for so we can tailor it better? So it's going to be a lot around evaluation happening for us in the next, you know, six to 12 months. So uh, just kind of finishing up with a story that we, we run a program called Connecting Provider to Home, which basically is focused on folks who have higher social needs. And it has a community health worker from the same community and a social worker. And so Mr. E is a, a prime example, lived in a mini RV, no running water, food, cooking facilities, or electricity, multiple ER visits. And I'm, ama I'm sure, and I know, he had amazing doctors and amazing hospital systems who prescribed the best medications. But if you ask Mr. E himself, what did he want? He wanted to be able to take a shower. He wanted to be appear well-dressed when he went to his doctor's office. He wanted to be able to cook his food or at least have a stable place where the food could get delivered. So what did we do? We deployed our community health worker. We provided resources that are available within the community. There are a lot of folks sitting around in the room here that run amazing community-based organizations, be it food banks and things like that. So we connected them to those things. And after six months in the program, not by giving any cutting edge treatment, just using the resources available and then creating an action plan from the care plan that was created by his healthcare team. We were able to reduce the total cost of care and I can tell you we were also able to improve his quality of life. So that was just a, a, a little uh, a flavor of how at SCAN we are focusing on our approach. You know, I wish we could uh, solve a lot more problems but our core focus for the next few years is gonna be on transportation, on housing, on providing access to nutrition and social engagement. And so we are continuing to build programs, deploy benefits, share best practices with our provider partners in those particular areas. So with that, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna pass it on to Naseem so she can go over what UCI is planning to do. As I mentioned earlier, I am thrilled to be here with you all this morning to be a part of this, uh, this critical conversation on how do we optimize our, our healthcare delivery systems to be able to address social determinants of health. Um, I want to start off with a story. So as I, as I mentioned, I'm a hospitalist, and this became very personal for me when I was on, on wards. Um, I uh, attend on wards with our, uh, with our residents. And um, they were, the residents were presenting a patient to me in the morning who had come in the night before with heart failure. So the, the, you know, your heart that's supposed to pump blood was not pumping as well. That led fluid to back up into the lungs. The patient was extremely short of breath. She had to be placed on oxygen. 
And um, the team did a phenomenal job between 10 p.m. when she came in with her husband and 7 a.m. when they were talking to me and being able to get that fluid off of her lungs and get that pump to work better to a point where she no longer needed the oxygen. She was getting up, going to the bathroom. She was eating, she was talking, and the team was presenting her to me because they felt that she was ready to go home. So when I looked at her history, it occurred to me that she had had heart failure for over a decade, and yet she had now been hospitalized three times over the past month. And so I asked them, I said, you know, why, why did she go into heart failure? Why is she here? And you know, we attract the best and the brightest, but I got to tell you, I got a lot of really blank stares. We went and we spoke with the patient and her husband, and it turned out that he had lost his job recently, and they realized how critical it was for her to get her heart failure medications. So they were putting all of their money into her getting her heart failure medications, but that meant that the fresh fruits, vegetables, the chicken, the salmon that they used to buy before was no longer in the price range where they could afford. So they were buying foods on sale. And what are the foods that are oftentimes on sale? It's all the salty stuff. It's the canned stuff. It's the freezer stuff. Um, and that salt content pulls in a lot of fluid and puts a lot of pressure on the pump of the body and leads to heart failure, which is why now, after a decade of being really well controlled and never needing a hospitalization, she needed three hospitalizations in a row. So we had a really great conversation with the team that day around the fact that as providers, staff, systems, we are so action-oriented, which is really great, but a lot of times in our enthusiasm to solve problems, we fail to stop and say, what's the root cause of this problem? And if I can truly address the root cause, then we actually don't have problems. And I think that's the critical aspect of social determinants of health and why, as a provider and a leader, I am so, um, I am so excited to see this as part of the dialogue and the conversation so that we are looking at patients holistically. Um, the talk that I'm giving um, right now, um, I, I could give over a two-day period, which I know you guys all cleared out your calendars for the next two days to be here, right? Um, I'm going to give it in about 10 to 15 minutes. First and foremost, I want to thank our amazing UCI Health team because they are the force behind this. Um, they are the ones who on a day-by-day -day basis get this done. I wanted to give you a sense of how on a delivery health system side we approach this. As the only academic medical center in the OC, we see it as our responsibility not only to deliver the highest quality of care, but to advance the research in this area and also advance education in this area. So we really have a, a, a tripartite mission in terms of how we need to how we need to approach this and how we need to advance this. So again, this is a very brief version. Please feel free to uh, talk to me afterwards if you want any more details, or better yet, talk to our wonderful team. There's a lot of them are on the back table um, to, uh, to my left right there. All right, so I broke this up into ambulatory care, inpatient care, and then how do we kind of bridge those gaps, because we're a delivery system, so that's, that's kind of how we think about things. So if you look at ambulatory care, we have two federally qualified health centers, one in Santa Ana, one in Anaheim. Um, they do close to 100,000 visits a year. They take care of our uh, most vulnerable patients. First and foremost, we focus on education because, again, we're, in, we're responsible for training the future providers of health care. So every uh, medical student rotation that comes through actually gets four hours on social determinants of health and population health management. But more importantly, then they turn this, in, this knowledge into a practical approach with it, where they interview community members around these topics and really gain <coughs> insights that they wouldn't otherwise have sitting in a class and just learning about this. They interact with our patients and are heavily involved in the care delivery side where, again, they get to experience this in a very different way. And that's built into our curriculum so that they leave their medical training. When they get their MD, they actually have a, a unique insight into a more holistic approach to care. 
We do group medical visits. We, I listed a couple of programs that we have this in, like diabetes and healthy living. These are provided also in Spanish to help address our uh, communities that, um, that, that uh, are either bilingual or prefer or more comfortable or can only uh, uh, get the information in Spanish. These classes, the larger ones, can range up to 18 patients. Um, they are extremely popular, and this has been a long-standing program that we've done for the community. We also, earlier this year, opened our uh, Louis Eisenberg teaching ki kitchen. Um, Dr. Uh, Kilgore had been a force behind how we add uh, food and medicine as a way to be able to heal our patients. This kitchen that's in our FQHCs, uh, patients get referred to it through their primary care doctors. They come, they get ingredients, and then they get uh, education around how do we do healthy cooking with um, easy, affordable ingredients, with uh, cooking utensils that, that are very easy and accessible. So this isn't a you know, full-on stove um, or, a, or a full kitchen, but that they're able to do these things at home. And these classes have been extremely popular. We have been investing in food security for a long time, realizing, again, food is the best medicine. We often try and treat things like diabetes and hypertension with layer after layer of medications. Um, a lot of times, again, if you look at the root cause, if it's poor diet that's leading to uncontrolled diabetes or poor diet that's leading to uncontrolled hypertension, you really have to go to the, to the root cause and to the source and address the nutritional component. Our food pantry is for our patients and communities in Santa Ana and Anaheim. It occurs two times per month. Um, it supports over 150 families in Santa Ana and over 100 families in Anaheim. We also have invested in uh, transportation for our patients who struggle with this. We have a great partnership with Caloptima, where for non-emergent medical visits, we're able to provide uh, transportation. And then we also provide taxi vouchers to be able to help and support our patients. Looking at inpatient care or hospital-based care, in the emergency room, one of the key, and again, I'm, I'm just kind of highlighting programs uh, in the interest of time, but one of the area, biggest areas of opportunity that we realized was a, along the homeless uh, population that comes through the ED. We get a large number of homeless patients who come to us through the ED. Again, if you look at the root cause of why they're coming in, a lot of times it has to do with issues with housing, food, clothing, um, and so we've really looked at how do we assess that, so we not only immediately assess that, but we provide immediate relief, so patients get food, they get weather appropriate clothing, um, medications for, for uh, homeless patients that come through get covered for three days, we um, assist with Medi-Cal applications, and then follow up healthcare appointments for, for our patients. Do we do that perfectly? No, I think we have a lot of opportunities for improvement in a number of areas, but it's a program, I think, as Ramla mentioned, you, you have to be out there, you have to be putting forth programs, and you have to continue to optimize them. And we're definitely dedicated to making sure that we're doing this in a seamless way as we move forward. Mental health is another issue, again, you already heard about it earlier today, that comes up over and over again as a tremendous area of opportunity where we need additional resources and brain power um, put forth to be able to solve this. We have two nurses who are mental health advocates. They screen our patients and connect them to community resources, and they help with everything from employment, food, and shelter. Our case management team has been robustly looking at how they can more effectively work through and address social determinants of health. In the ED department for our psychiatry patients, we um, already had two existing social workers who were quite busy. But when we looked at the effectiveness of the program, we realized that our biggest gaps were really between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. That's when we got a lot of patients. That's when we had the least number of resources. So we actually invested in two new positions that are purely dedicated to the nighttime. Very popular positions. Um, the uh, amazing social workers do complete assessments, and they connect our patients to community 
resources. And there we have a partnership with the Illumination Foundation that looks at temporary placement as well as recuperative care. And then we have social workers in a number of different areas. Again, I, I highlighted um, just one there. So in our senior center, they actually do home visits for, for a more holistic approach to care, where again, they do assessments and that those assessments are brought back. We also have uh, 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 APPs are, are uh, nurse practitioners and physician assistants who also go for patients who are homebound and can't come in for visits. They actually go and do home visits for the patients. And so in addition to the uh, social determinants of health that's assessed through our social work team, the patient's also able to receive medical care uh, through, that, uh, through that support. And then we have a number of support groups for our patients that help address uh, social determinants of health, health and help connect them to the community, like our cancer center, bariatrics, neuro-oncology. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about bridging the gap. Um, I uh, tidied the, this up really nicely for the purpose of the presentation to call it ambulatory and inpatient. The reality of it is in a care delivery system, we care for patients throughout the continuum of their life and throughout the continuum of settings. A lot of what, uh, what happens is outside the four walls of our hospitals or our clinics, and we're dedicated, as I, I mentioned earlier, in being out where patients are, where they live and function. We, uh, through our Accountable Care Organization, have a dedicated team of health coaches. This is, again, a pilot for us that we hope to be able to expand and advance. This, these health coaches are non-licensed, but extremely skilled at being able to um, assess for a variety of factors that lead to root causes of why are our patients not thriving? Why are they not doing well? That information is then integrated in a number of ways into our electronic health record. It is addressed in real time for areas where we have gaps. It's put into the annual visit that we have with the patient so that we can make sure that we have action plans created. And again, our patients are connected to resources throughout the community to really be able to deliver on the aim of taking care of the patient, the population, and be able to, to do this in an affordable way for everybody. As we look at the vision for the future and what we need to do to be able to move forward, I think looking at assessing resources, uh, tools that can be accessed by patients, not just when they interact with us. I think that's a um, that, that's kind of an old model. You have to wait to come to us for assessment to happen. I think to have real time assessment to have. Uh, access through our electronic health records so that this could be pushed out to patients. They could fill it out on their phone. They could fill it out on a, on a computer. Um, they could fill it out into, in, in any way that they, can act, that they have access to be able to um, let us know um, of changing status and for us to actually be able to connect them to community resources. Um, staffing support is something that we continue to invest in. Um, as Ramla mentioned, we are actively evaluating the various ways that we are supporting this population of patients to look at what are the effective models for us to be able to invest in further and be able to grow. And then the last part, which is only getting one bullet but really deserves um, a lot of emphasis, is as a care delivery system, we are grateful to our community partners to be able to deliver the resources that our patients need. And we need to continue to invest in those and grow those community partnerships as we move forward to be able to provide additional resources to our patients out in the communities where they work and function. And as we found with our partners, they have a much better sense being out there in the community of what the patients need and have added tremendously to the two-way dialogue that we have as we're trying to solve some of these most challenging uh, problems in healthcare. So with that, I'm going to pass the baton down. Thank you. All right, well, good morning. It is great to see everyone here. I wanted to talk <clears throat> a little bit about homeless health care. I think as we know, it's homelessness is a uh, becoming more and more of a major issue nationally and in California. We see this in the papers, San Francisco, Los Angeles. But it's definitely also 
an issue here in Orange County, really in our backyards locally. So I just want to get a sense of how many of you in your drive, in your routine drive, see homeless people on the way? Yes, definitely. I was intentional this morning as I drove down from North County, my 45 minute drive, a little bit long, took the scenic route along PCH, but I counted seven homeless individuals that I saw just this morning on the way in. So it's definitely something that is becoming more and more of an issue. It's already a huge issue. Um, and just to give you a better sense of the numbers, every two years the federal government requires all the counties to do a point in time count. So they go out and they count the number of um, individuals who are unhoused in their county. This was done by Orange County um, in April of this year and the count was 6,860. So it's a pretty significant number. Um, and really, um, the question is, how do we attack this? What actions do we take? And how can we improve the health care of the homeless? So I wanted to mention a few of the actions that we've started taking at Cal Optima and the lessons that we've learned. So as I mentioned, Cal Optima is responsible for the care of all of the Medi-Cal members in Orange County. Um, and the board did uh, approve an allocation of $100 million for, uh, to focus on the, the homeless health care. And I think we started by really thinking about what are the disparities in the homeless population versus the non-homeless population? How can we listen and learn and find out what their needs are? And what are the barriers that they're experiencing to care or to not receiving care? Definitely homeless individuals have a lower life expectancy. And this seems to be due to an increased uh, incident of illnesses, significant illnesses, as well as um, decreased adherence with care. So we really wanted to think in terms of population health and systems of care. Uh, even without being homeless, the healthcare system is complex enough. There are multiple uh, features to it, physical health, behavioral health, sometimes separated, they're complex to navigate. Plus with homeless, they have additional issues with transportation, they have their um, uh, there are belongings that are with them that they can't really store very well. Some of them have pets. So we have to really think about what are the gaps in the system and what can we do better? And what we wanted to start with was, I guess what we were calling downstream. So what are the immediate needs? What can we fill, what can we provide that's going to make a difference right away and then work our way backwards? And we're also thinking about how we can improve while we're building this at the same time. So our immediate solution was what we call the clinical field teams. So um, these are care teams that provide um, medical services where the homeless are located. So we want to um, assess, evaluate, adjust, and um, improve as we're going along. So we're basically building the plane while we're flying it. And so I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what this looks like in practice. So this is uh, Francisco. He's one of our care coordinators for our clinical field teams. We call these uh, street medicine teams. Um, so they really, um, they go out where the homeless are located and provide the care that they need. Um, they have their own equipment and supplies at blood pressure cuffs, uh, stethoscopes. They can do simple tests. Um, finger stick tests, they can get results right away. Um, they have wound care equipment, they have other supplies, um, and they bring it all with them. Uh, they either have a backpack, they, uh, this team has a, um, a little cart that they bring. They have electronic medical records, so they have computers, so we can get the records almost right away. Um, and then, uh, so they're available uh, to um, come on site and really 
um, eliminate some of those issues with transportation, homeless, accessing uh, the care. And so how this works is uh, we've worked very closely with the uh, Orange County Healthcare Agency um, outreach and engagement teams. So they've primarily focused on behavioral health, Caloptimo focuses on physical health. But those teams have been uh, in the field working with this homeless population, working with community partners very extensively. So they already have uh, relationships and they were um, kind enough to uh, help us when they identify a physical health care need, they would um, notify our team. We also established a homeless response team. It's a group of care managers and care coordinators located at Cal Optima that help coordinate the care for the homeless. So if they identify a homeless individual who needs health care, they will notify our team and then we'll evaluate the patient, gather more information and send out um, the clinical field team who within hopefully 90 minutes or so is our goal. They'll go out to the field, provide any necessary care. So we've been dealing with a lot of um, wound care issues, um, bumps and bruises, upper respiratory infections, kind of urgent care type of things. Um, and we're able to provide you know, treatments, breathing treatments, other kind of treatments there. They have medications they can bring. They can also prescribe medications. We can coordinate some kind of delivery as well to facilitate things. Um, so we're able to um, provide some care immediately. And then our goal is to move them back into the traditional health care system, connect them with that federally qualified health care center, and be able to continue care and have more continuity of care that way. So it's a bridging um, into the traditional healthcare system. And we wanted to intentionally work with the federally qualified healthcare centers because CalOptima is uh, responsible for CalOptima members. We can only provide services for CalOptima members, but we didn't want to limit it to just CalOptima members because we know that some homeless are eligible, haven't um, signed up, are enrolled in CalOptima yet or Medi-Cal. So, we didn't want to have a situation where we're asking, are you a Cal Optima member? Do you have your card? That type of thing. So we wanted to work, we intentionally worked with the federally uh, qualified healthcare centers because they have as their mission uh, taking, providing care for all individuals or regardless of the uh, ability to pay. So if they're Cal Optima members, we provide that funding. If they're not Cal Optima members, they have other sources of funding that can help take care of those patients. So it's available to all the homeless which is very important to us. And we have great partners and that uh, is essential to success. Um, this has been done in other places. There are, there are street medicine teams, but they generally are limited in the hours or the services or the locations. Um, I think our program is much more comprehensive. Um, we're working towards having it daily. It's six days a week right now. We're also looking at uh, extended uh, hours in the evenings because we think that's important. It's available throughout the county, North County, Central County, South County as well. Uh, so that's very important. It's been challenging covering such a big county. But again, partnerships are important to be able to do that. And then, like I said, we're not limited to one location. A lot of programs, maybe we'll go to a shelter, a soup kitchen, and that's all the only place they go. So we really are anywhere in the county. We go to the hot spots, um, tend to be shelters, parks, encampments, bus stops, gas stations, wherever the homeless are, wherever the, the care is needed. Again, we're building this as we go. So we're evaluating and we're looking at a number of things. Um, we're tracking the services that are provided by the teams, the number of calls we get, the number they're treated, the referrals and connections that we make into the system. We're also looking at the impact on our overall utilization for that population. So the number of emergency room visits, hospitalizations, readmissions, primary care visits. Again, our goal is to get them into the traditional system access ambulatory care and reduce some of these other acute uh, care needs. 
And then this is also part of the larger Orange County whole person care pilot. So we're evaluating um, that at the, at the same time as, as the street medicine efforts. And I want to talk a little bit about lessons learned, because like I said, we're building this as we fly it, so we're really uh, learning as we go. I think there have been some really important lessons that we have learned. One, like I mentioned, partnerships are really important. This is a complex, challenging population. So having great partners is really important. Um, working with the county has been fabulous. They've been collaborating very closely. Recuperative care, community-based organizations are important. Our medical groups and networks, hospitals, UCIs, great. Um, and the, the community clinics as well. And then there are just individuals throughout the community who are passionate about this and have given their input and their guidance and their feedback. And that's been really important, uh, learning from them. And the last thing I was going to say is that for lessons learned is there is no quick fix. There is no simple solution. This is not a one-size-fits-all problem. So this is a starting point. We've done other things that we've, with $100 million, we um, contributed $11 million to the Be Well OC project. So that's a behavioral health crisis intervention center that's available for anyone in the community. So that's going to be a very important component of the system. We also gave $10 million to support recuperative care and the whole person care pilot. Um, that's essential in terms of um, connecting individuals uh, with the system, uh, allowing them to uh, get better and um, have a, uh, improve their outcomes. Um, and then our homeless response team and our clinical field teams as well. And we're moving our way backwards. We're thinking about other interventions um, in the hospitals and upon discharge that we can help improve the system. And then I think ultimately um, it is true that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of treatment. So as we begin to think about uh, other targets of preventing those or addressing people who are at risk of homelessness and providing support to them trying to prevent them from becoming homeless in the first place, that will, make, uh, that will have a huge impact. So together, we can make a difference, and we are making a difference, one program at a time, one visit at a time, and one person at a time. So thank you. Thank you. So I'll hand off to Paul now. Great, they put the old guy at the end, so I gotta like navigate getting up here. Well, good morning, everybody, and I, I joke around about that, but so we have some exciting news. A few years, actually two years ago, we were um, approached by AARP and we were nominated to um, volunteer um, some of our programs, of recuperative care, social determinants of health, and you know, we didn't realize two years ago that that was going to be a two-year process for this RFP. And so what had happened, of course, being a senior, I forgot all about it. And then <laughs> we, we got notified the other day that they had 1,400 nonprofits that they looked at. They wanted to select five to scale up. And we found out the other day we're one of the five. Um, <laughs> We weren't supposed to tell anybody till November 1st, but oh well. So don't tell anybody. One more day. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's so funny because when I told my kids, we're, I said, we're going to be on the cover of ARP. They started laughing. They go, isn't that that old people's magazine? <laughs> um, but the, the point of it is that we've been doing this 15 years. And I look around the room and, and see people we've been working with all this time. Ed back there when we started. Um, it, it was a challenge. Um, we started at an MBA school, and Paul Cho, our CFO and co-founder, said if we would have known back then what we know now, we probably would have quit right from the start. Um, because literally, 
um, we kind of grew up in Orange County, and you have to navigate county, city, you know, um, each city has its own mayor. It, it's not like L.A. or any other cities. So when we started, we really had to toughen up. We really had to, to um, show through data, show through our programs of, of what we actually did in Illumination Foundation and why it was or was not working. And as I said, 10 years ago, we were doing social determinants of health. And that's how recuperative care came about. Naturally, a lot of people call it medical respite, but they do a heavier component of medical. We do mental health, substance abuse, and the social determinants of health. So when we started, um, and here's the same numbers that uh, David was talking about, they're actually higher. Um, we were talking to some people at Cal Optima, and they're using the number 10,000. And, and this is what we know we have at least 6,800, but we're thinking more along 10,000. Um, we saw right away that there were two components to what we are seeing. Healthcare, and this is, we'll, we'll kind of bear out what we are seeing. Mental health disorders, alcohol, drug use, um, are the two things that we were seeing, 90% of our clients that we were taking care of came in with these two problems. And then the other problem that we were seeing was housing. And fortunately, we were able to join a national board, National Healthcare for the Homeless, and we realized that a lot of people around the nation were doing this kind of work. And that housing, as you could see, solved a lot of problems. It didn't solve everything, but it solved a lot of problems. And you just have to look at the percentages. Fortunately, we were able to get a couple pilot programs, and our first pilot program was Chronic Care Plus, and it actually started in 2014. This was actually doing um, social determinants of health. You could see we were doing case management, financial literacy, job training. We were doing all this in 2014, and we had the numbers to show it. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we won that ARP prize um, prize award is because they saw this data and they had been working in a lot of these same arenas, but they didn't have such succinct data and they didn't have the numbers of people that we were seeing here in Orange County. Um, you could see what you would think. The numbers went down for chronic use of the ER, um, but you could see the cost savings per hospital. And at that time, we were only using St. Joe's. Obviously, the program was a success, and we started out recuperative care and moved on to, um, to what we called street to home. We actually, at that one time, we were taking care of 63 people. We advanced it to 108 people, and we kept the individuals for two years. We have those numbers, and those numbers will show uh, even more savings. And each year, that number keeps going up. So um, David talked a little bit about whole person care. We started when whole person care started in Orange County. It was a huge success because it actually used recuperative and it addressed housing on the back end. Um, I think right now it actually more than 708. I think we have 1,300 clients who came through um, whole person care. Um, we take them into recuperative care connect them to services, and then move them into housing. Here are some of the numbers actually we got from Cal Optima, and you could see um, how many times our clients, and ours were the most vulnerable, and we say most vulnerable, but those are the clients that you see out on the street who aren't connected to services. We connect them to recuperative care and then follow them into permanent supportive housing. So you could see how many more times our clients use the ER. This number shows it in monetary um, numbers. Prior to coming into whole person care, the cost to Cal Optima was 1,075. While, while they were in recuperative, it dropped all the way to 74. When we moved them into permanent supportive housing, it, it still stayed down. It went up a little to 261. So when 
not only Cal Optima, but the county and the state saw these numbers um, and nationally saw these numbers, they knew that whole person care was a really, really effective program. Again, we were doing social determinants of health. Um, so to take that a little further, the, they know, we know whole person care runs out in 2020. It was a pilot program and already the state and federal government medical health is starting to look um, at how they can keep a program similar to this going and, and they're thinking about health homes. I don't know if anybody's here heard of health homes, but it is a program that's similar to whole person care, but a little bit more intense on social determinants of health. And so in alignment with that, we kind of realized that the hub is a recuperative care or a shelter and that you actually had to follow our clients into permanent supportive housing. If you didn't do that, many of them would fall out of housing and then go back to the street. We've created a program where you could be in recuperative care, go into permanent supportive housing, and if you relapsed or didn't stay on your psych meds, you could come back into recuperative care. And we called it the hub and spoke model. One other program that I'll go over real quick, um, back in May 2019, I'm sure many of you remember when they cleared out the riverbed. And a lot of that fallout you're seeing today, because a lot of those people are still in neighborhoods, they're not connected to housing. The, um, the healthcare agency came to us and said, would you take 200 clients? And we said, we, there's no way we could take 200 clients because you would have to have recuperative care for those 200 clients and then permanent supportive um, housing in our view at the back end. And so we said we could take 60 and they awarded us 2.9. We took in 60 people at one time and over the year we took 123 of the most vulnerable. And when we say most vulnerable, um, think about it. If you were ever by the riverbed, they were people that were, had been homeless for longer than five or 10 years. Some new homeless that were really, really addicted to heroin, crystal meth, and or individuals that were, had significant psychological problems, schizophrenia, bipolar, and just were not connected. On, on opening day, we took 35 of those individuals into our program, along with about 50 dogs, and they weren't small chihuahuas, they were <laughs> pit bulls, four cats and a parrot. And they literally, the healthcare agency dropped them off at our front door, and Jason, who's here now, he, he was actually only 16 when he started. Um, <laughs> But he accepted those clients in. We ran those clients for a year. We took care of them. We did all the wraparound social determinants of health. And you can see, I think it's higher now, but I think we have 62 individuals from that program that are permanent supported housing right now. So to us, that was a huge, huge success. This is probably going to be the precursor to health homes. Uh, because we're on a couple national boards and, and back and forth to D.C. And, and giving them this information as to what works and what doesn't. So our solution is housing, recuperative care, against substance abuse, because most of our clients have substance abuse problems, and behavioral health. Now, our partners are doing a lot of this. The healthcare agency, Cal Optima, UCI, they do a lot of these services. And... Just recently, Orange County really started to address um, housing. And I know United Way, Sue's back in the back, has really made it a concerted effort to bring people together on housing. Because housing is one of the toughest things to do. You know, you have to not only manage the housing, but you have to manage the clients in the housing. Um, there's been actually six shelters that opened up in Orange County in the last two years. We run one of them in Anaheim. 
Mercy House runs uh, the one in Santa Ana. Um, there's the courtyard in Santa Ana, another shelter. And then um, Salvation Army runs a large shelter in Anaheim also. We want to combine a shelter with a recuperative care. We think that that's the answer. You could have people that don't need quite as many services come into the shelter, and then people that are sick, mental health, substance abuse, can use that portion of the recuperative care. So we have um, a city, Fullerton, who agreed to open up their city to have a citywide uh, or a countywide answer to this problem. November 5th, their city council votes on it. And if it goes forward, we've already purchased the building. It will be the first in the nation that combines 150 beds that are recuperative and shelter. And then last but not least, micro communities. Um, along with United Way and, and a lot of other partners that I haven't mentioned, we were able to purchase um, six bedroom houses and apartments to be able to then move people from recuperative into permanent supportive housing. And you should see some of the houses, the six bedroom, they are like really, really nice houses. They're usually the best on the block. Our staff and our clients keep the houses up. Um, but someone asked me the other day, would you like one of them next to you? And I said, absolutely. I have teenagers on the right side of me and they, they're like partying at night, driving trucks, <laughs> playing video games. Um, our clients, we put six in at a time or a couple families. They usually don't drive. They're quiet. And as we alluded to, our life expectancy is 83. Our clients is 47. So we're dealing with seniors. I mean, what disease process do you know that takes 36 years off your life? Um, it's not cancer, it's not CHF, it's homelessness. So our clients are usually the best neighbors. They're quiet, they're in bed by nine o'clock, about a half an hour later than me. Um, <laughs> but again, what we've learned through this is the partnerships working with business, and by the way, we just, on October 31st, we're gonna have the first syndicate, um, and every time I say that, I feel like I'm part of the mafia, but <laughs> I understand it's a business term, where we're gonna have individuals, investors, purchasing these properties, and then we're gonna put the homeless in them. Um, and it's really taking off, and it's probably the answer as far as funding, that and vouchers for many communities. Obviously, government, hospitals, we need it all. We need these partnerships. Um, so again, aligned goals, these are all things that you all probably know about. Um, we've been able in the last 15 years to, this is our board, to really access people that are in business. This was a help from UCI um, School of Business, a shout out for you guys because you taught us how to network with all these people um, and to really get their buy-in um, to be able to um, work on this problem. I put in our revenue growth because I have to tell you, we started in my garage because my wife would not let us at the kitchen table because we were making a mess. So we actually started in our garage with $50,000. Um, we're going to be about a $22 million nonprofit last year, but it could double because all the properties we just purchased and the contracts that we just signed. Um, so it kind of is reflective of the problem. You know, we were not planning on growing. We were planning on doing this for a while and then going back to our day jobs, and it ended up taking over. Um, but I'll, and I'll leave you with one last, um, one last ask and one last comment. You know, when you talk about homelessness, I think the thing that conjures in our mind is the individual that's on the street like David saw driving up, male or female. A lot of times that you don't realize about the children and that children with trauma. And you also don't realize about the seniors, our fastest growing population of homeless are seniors and women. 
and they're outliving their money. And so in that shelter that I just showed you, we have four 80-year-olds, 80-year-olds, who their family couldn't take care of them and they dropped them off at the shelter. I can tell you that the common thread on all these people is hope. I don't care if you're talking to two young girls, seven and eight, in our program, or you're talking to a gentleman who used to have a job, or you're talking to an 80-year-old. When you look in their eyes, they've lost hope. And I honestly believe the biggest lesson we learn is compassion. And that if we treat these clients with respect and compassion, they will thrive. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to our panel. And we'll open it up for questions. And as people are thinking about questions, I'm going to start off with one that I had. It, it's heartening to hear that all of us are trying and striving to create these models, some that have been done and some we are just trying. And it's also heartening to hear that we are trying to tap into resources that we perhaps did not use before, like health coaches and community health workers and perhaps social workers to some extent because there's not that many doctors and nurses that are available. But in today's day and age, I am, I'm interested in hearing, especially as we talk about partnership, leveraging resources in the communities, are you utilizing any you know, technology-based solutions to connect or do things like that? Um, any one of you who want to find on that? You know, I think th there is a component of this um, th that is so human-based as we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we tackle this. Um, that, you know, technology is a tool. Yep, of course. First, you have to know what you're doing and the problem that you're addressing before you can put that in. We're not at a point no. where, where that's going to be the piece that's leveraged. I do think, um, back to Paul's point, the, 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 there's a lot to be said for kind of that human uh, connection and the compassion that comes in doing this work. Um, and for that, honestly, I feel like the biggest place where we're making a lot of investment is in, is in people, people resources. Anybody else? I was gonna say data integration is really important. Um, there, we do have a common platform where, for communication and sharing information. Um, so that's a, that's a helpful piece among the different um, partners and uh, coordinators. And then I, I think telehealth ultimately could have a role here. We haven't implemented that yet, but it's something we will consider. So that has some potential as well. Um, you know, we just uh, came back from a, and, and a couple of you guys had mentioned to it, um, a conference that was in San Diego, and it was called Root Cause. There was a thousand people at this conference, and again, <laughs> We kind of try to think we're innovative, but then all of a sudden you walk in, there's a thousand people there who are doing what we're doing, and we're way further ahead on social determinants of health. And they have a lot of the data, they have a lot of things that they tried and, and are working and didn't work. By the way, we have all those slides if anybody's interested in, and it's called Root Cause. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Root Cause Coalition. They're, theme this year is social determinants of health. And I think next year it's going to be in Phoenix, but I think bringing people together um, and just sharing ideas of what's worked, what hadn't worked, we were just amazed that um, people were a lot more knowledgeable than and had been doing it a long time. Um, and so we've kind of uh, prided ourselves in, in looking at nationally what they're doing and, and bringing those things back. To Orange County. I know for us, um, you know, what where we struggled the most as a plan was we had a lot of health related data, but we did not have any social factor related data. And even when we get it, you know, our, we started doing HRA for all for our 200,000 population. I mean, the response rate is 30%, 40%. What about the rest of them? 
Is there a place for us to getting data on a zip code basis? And so we've tried to start looking into that. That's one thing we are doing. The second thing what we are doing is when we find out somebody needs, you know, simple things like uh, so a handyman to fix X, Y, and Z. If they don't have a benefit, how do we organize that stuff? And so there are platforms that are available right now. Uh, we use one called Aunt Bertha, which basically is an inventory of all community-based organizations with all their capabilities that are out there. So for example, when my case manager you know, says this person needs housing or this person needs food and does not have benefits or programs, she can put in a zip code, put in the language, put in the age, gender, and it will tell you here are the three or four organizations that are offering stuff. And not only can she do that, but they can do a referral. Think about it as a mammogram referral. So you, the community-based organization then can accept the referral and you can see exactly what's happening. So going back to, to your point of leveraging technology for that, but in the end, it's my coordinator who's saying, okay, Mr. Smith, your food, you can go here, pick it up from this food bank. They already know about you, have already done the paperwork for you. So I thought that was a useful way and we are still like kind of playing with it. And there's a lot they can do with the EMR system. So, you know, your physicians or your, our offices, when they know this person has a transportation problem, can do similar things and can follow the, the whole referral process. So something to be said about it. So, okay, any questions from the audience? We had a lot of very interactive discussion. We'll go start with you. Please introduce yourself and... Uh, and so one of my questions, I don't know how much questions, but, um, you know, what you start to describe is it seems like it's at the point of care, the point of context, so it's self-reported data on social determinants, and it's like at a time where you cannot prevent anything that's transpired. So enriching with uh, data um, just so that you can manage your population more proactively uh, and relying on you know, self-reported data as well. Um, people don't like to report some things, it's an you know, uncomfortable situation, so have you going kind to of consider that, and uh, especially as you start like seeing more adoption, how are you going to start to rank the, the vulnerability or, you know, who should get your resources that are limited, right, uh, so that you can make the biggest impact? That's such a great point. Thank you so much for that question. I think if you look at the core of population health management, it's about prevention, right? It's about moving further upstream. And you're absolutely right. We all talked about kind of what do we do when the problem is at our, at our door? Um, and we're figuring out how to do that. But really, you got to go further upstream to identify those vulnerabilities. If I was to kind of take a step back and say, how does one approach this and look at how we've done this in other areas in healthcare? Um, about 15 years ago, when we started as a country to look at readmissions, we started with patients being readmitted and then looking at how do we prevent the next one? And then we went back and said, well, how about the first time they get hospitalized? What do we do to make sure that they don't come back in? And then we got better and said, well, what are the risk factors for that first hospitalization? And how do we prevent that so that when we see them in clinic, that doesn't end up being a readmission? And now we've moved further back and say, how do we actually find those vulnerabilities when people are in their communities, where they live, they function, they work? And I think I see a very similar uh, pathway to that understanding. And there's, a, there's examples of best practices around how we move further upstream. I think uh, you know, some, of the, some of that was hinted to, but it's that same evaluation as we look at the data, uh, that same evalu evaluation of the vulnerabilities to actually prevent it to getting to the point where we are today. So I just wanted to emphasize that point, and I'm going to bank that as something that we should proactively look at as, as we're going on our journey. I was going to say, one of the initiatives of the California State Surgeon General is child screening for childhood trauma. Yeah. That has a, it's, I guess it's one of the social determinants of health, but has a huge impact on adult health. So um, as part of Proposition 56, there are incentive payments to providers to screen for that. So we're preparing... Um, to support that initiative. So that I think will provide a lot of information and hopefully be able to identify some of those individuals and then get them into the appropriate uh, treatment. So that's you know, one example of thing that's 
that's going to be happening within the next really few months. Yeah, um, Dr. Nadine Burke is our new Surgeon General, so it's pretty exciting because California is the only state that has a Surgeon General just for our state. But on ACEs, but back to your original question, social determinants of health, there's several tools, one pretty much recognized by everybody. Um, I always forget the name. Prepare. Prepare, yeah, prepare that. Mm -hmm. um, we'll kind of give you a good idea of where individuals are at and how far they've come. We can look at it and say, they have been receiving or haven't. But I think the other thing that's really important in Orange County, I'm not, I don't know if all of you are familiar with VI SPADAT, but it is a, it's a tool that measures housing and who needs housing first. And it's been, in Orange County, it's been here like five years. When it first came out, it, it, we had problems with it as a county because our most vulnerable and the way they rate the most vulnerable is who's gonna die tonight, should get housing on the street, should get housing first. And that wasn't happening. Now, pretty much all the nonprofits, the hospitals, everybody who's working with people at risk of homelessness, kind of, it, it's working well. And that, they're, they're given a score and we know who probably should go into housing first. So there, there are tools that they're starting to use. We, we probably could um, really work on them more and more. But the most important thing, and I think for a lot of individuals in this room, when we would have things like that in the past, it would be great and we'd be going like, oh wow, that's exciting, but no funding. Mm -hmm. There's funding yeah. now for all this. And, and we've made more progress in the last year than we've had in the last 13 years. Because if you have a good, um, idea and we work really closely with Cal Optima in the county. There's funding that we can then apply for and write our own RFP to them and show that it'll work. So it's really an exciting time, um, especially in California, but throughout the nation because people have realized it is a crisis and we really have to take care of it. I think for us, it is all about identifying, you know, and risk stratifying. And that was a problem because our model was a very medical model. It truly was like, what's the matter with you model, I call it. And it was more uh, physician-centered, payer-centered versus person-centered. So as we are you know, taking these data points in one of my slides I shared with you, we are updating our model. And our model has domains around self-efficacy. I need to decide what's the best for me around cognition. We understand that's a big deal around function, so you know, can I toilet, can I bath, can I groom, and then also around medical and social determinants of health. We're using artificial intelligence, machine learning. We also have data on people for the last 30 years. They have been calling us, so we are doing text analytics, voice analytics, and our goal is to then create a model to say, here is our top 5% of a population that we know will need those things. So let's see how can we meet those needs. And yes, we are not going to design all these benefits, but you know, IHI, I'm a, a, a participant in IHI, it always says assume abundance. So there are community-based resources. Our members or your patients may not be aware of it. How do we connect the right people to the right resources? So that's where we are doing that connection through technology or care coordinators to make it happen for those people. And then going more upstream in affordability. So a few years back, we hunkered down and we said, you know, if you want to make care affordable, let's make sure most of our medicines are zero dollar copay. We did really, really well. I mean, if you look at it, 90% of our population, 90 plus percent is on generics and pay zero dollars for their copay. Did that help them? Yes, they, that, that did help them, the benefit design in that particular way. So now that we have this data, can we go more upstream and start doing things so care can become affordable? So for example, last year when we did the return to home, it was just post-discharge high-risk population. We learned from it and said, let's go more upstream. So next year, people will get meals even if they have one of those chronic conditions. They don't have to be hospitalized. So as the programs mature, as our risk stratification matures, we can do both the reactive posturing for the folks that are high risk, but also start thinking proactively. The devil always comes to sustainability. You know, how much can we keep investing back unless we show there's a reduction in total cost of care? 
And so it doesn't have to happen just for us. It also has to happen for our provider partners and hospital partners because everybody is managing to their book of business. So the goal is to see, you know, how can we work together? And it looks like a lot of us are working together really well in trying to see how are we solving for this problem without kind of using each other's resources and coming together to the table. Yes, please. Hi, um, I'm Beth Bashmoy. Um, I'm Chief Operating Officer of Planned Parenthood. I'm getting the voice of the I'm of Orange San Bernardino County. We see about 215,000 visits um, in a year um, and serving the patient's whole population, mainly younger patients. Um, one thing I would say just regar regarding online health services is that we do have an app that uh, does birth control here in this state and other states, birth control and UTI, and it's extremely popular. So I would say um, hopefully to consider the use of technology for these populations because um, we're, we're also starting a pilot with IHP, which is a very forward-thinking um, company on behavioral health online because patients that have transportation problems and child care problems with shift work, it's much easier to have an online appointment. So I do think that is actually part of the solution and I hope it's pursued in Orange County as well. Um, but my question for the team is that um, I, you know, we're not part of an ACO. There's many community clinics that are not part of an ACO. So, so we would we have a large homeless population that we serve, um, but there is no funding resources for us to address the social determinants of health. And while we could get the great funding, most organizations like ours aren't set up to go out for and manage grants because that's a you know a full time function and job that a lot of direct care delivery organizations don't have. So some other states, I understand, are doing some innovative things behind fee-for-service payment um, where, where billing codes are addressing. If you're addressing social determinants of health, you can, you can bill higher. But at this point, many community clinics are in the situation that I'm in, which is if there is no funding mechanism to pay for that case management or that outreach, I was looking at your slide with two RNs doing case management. I was so jealous. I would love to do that. But I, there's no funding for me to do that, even though my population is large and vulnerable. So I guess it's what is your all's advice or counsel on you know what how to move forward when you're still in a fee for service non ACO environment, and you know how can I better serve my patients in addressing the social determinants of health? I have the staff, I have the doctors, I just don't have pain. It's a tough place to be. <laughs> Especially in California, where more and more care is going towards value-based care. I mean, I don't know if there is an opportunity because a lot of our provider partners, I can speak for us at SCAN, a lot of our provider partners are looking for that kind of an expertise. They have the medical expertise. So perhaps <coughs> there's a there there. Yeah. Well, first of all, a question for David Kudama from the Nation Foundation. I think it's great that Health Home comes down with time that we're really addressing some of those issues and serving the local population. But I was also wondering if Caloptimo is also looking at ways, because I know with CMS and Medicaid dollars, you can't really fund housing. But there are programs, you know, Medicaid dollars around different states that have started to invest in housing. <coughs> Um, is Caloptima starting to look at that? Because that's where we sort of all the struggle. Like, we want to move people into housing and manage, but how do we get those supports to the United States dollars? Well, we've definitely looked into it. Un unfortunately, housing is not a covered benefit through Medi Cal, so we're not able to support that, those type of efforts. The closest that there is is really through the Health Homes program. Um, so, that's definitely you know part of the solution. I mean, I think maybe you know advocating at the state level. I would say in general, besides housing, I think that in general, Medicaid and Medi-Cal are a little bit behind Medicare in terms of providing those benefits like food and the other kind of social determinant of health benefits. I know that it's on you know social determinants of health are important to the state. And to state Medi-Cal, they just haven't gotten to the point where they've included that in the benefits, but hopefully they move in that direction soon. Yeah. Well. I just want to go back to the last question, um, because now what we're finding out um, really integrated services is that the client themselves has funding. It may not be under that particular entity, but you know, we could fund some services for them and partner with different organizations. I think before everybody was looking 
well, I have to be the lead agency. Funding has to come through me. But now it's really, we've really become integrated with other housing nonprofits, homeless nonprofits, and we've been sharing a lot of the, the funding. Um, because it sounds crazy, but you need a certain volume of homeless people, right? So we're actually looking for bigger pools of homeless people uh, because no one just wants to serve 20. They want to serve 200. So I, I think that would be a good way to connect with other nonprofits and do a joint RFP or just fund part of what uh, you're doing and share the, the funding. I think you, you had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank all of our speakers for the wonderful services that these organizations are providing to our communities to address this very complex and challenging situation. I would like to question uh, Paul Leone. Uh, my understanding is that you are uh, a bit distinctive in your organization and that you are actually out on the street looking for people who need the service, picking them up and taking them where they can get help. And I, I was wondering how you, how you identify people on the street who should be picked up and what percentage of those are transported to emergency rooms? Well, the nice thing is that we have now outreach that David was talking about, so we don't have to do the heavy lifting. Um, the outreach and engagement team from the county, city net, there's a lot of people that now do the outreach, and we're getting better at them understanding, okay, do they really need to go to the ER or can they just, you know, be seen by a nurse practitioner out in the street and then come to recuperative and or maybe into straight into housing first, permanent supportive housing. So we actually are doing less outreach than we had done. And it's, it's a welcome relief for us because now we can concentrate on what we do as recuperative and then housing after they get out of recuperative care. So all those things are falling in line um, as the community grows. Thank you to all the speakers for this good insight on how to act on the social determinants of health and the impact that, that you have on the uh, uh, health of the community. I also wanted to ask more from healthcare organizations as to the first step as to how they are approaching and how they are collecting the data for the social determinants of health. I know we all talk about the care. I wanted to know that that was the most common tool everybody is using, and people are using other tools, and how they are administering and how they're going about collecting the data in the first place. I can start off. So we took prepare. Um, you know, we just do Medicare managed care. So our, our lives are all senior lives. We took prepare and we used questions from that because they're evidence based, validated questions. We also added some of our own questions that we find useful around activities of daily living. We wanted to also get data on language. Believe it or not, we don't have that. And then what we have done it is we have done it in three formats. Either we do an IVR, so there's an automated message phone call you get, and you say push one for this, two for that. When we don't receive, and we try it three times, if you don't get the data back through that, then we will mail it out, so the usual paper way of doing it, and they can mail it back to us. And if you don't receive that and we are still worried about a certain proportion of our population, then we will outreach through our care coordinators who will be on the phone and collect that data. So that's the proactive part of it. The people who are already in our case management, disease management, care transitions, PALT and other programs, we are collecting the data as they're enrolling with us if we don't have that data. So for us, it's like all hands on deck to collect that data because that data will then help us risk stratify and help us address those interventions. I'm gonna pass it back to you. I was gonna say, well, we have, um for our high risk members, we have a, an assessment tool that we use and we create an individualized care plan for them and it's a lot of this, you know, it's a very holistic approach. So that's a case by case kind of uh, approach that we have to assessing and connecting those members. Anyone else? Well, on that conference that I was talking about the root cause, they actually had quite a few hospitals that now 
one of the problems of, of what they're doing, they're screening for ACEs, right? Childhood adverse effects, but also now for food insecurities. So one of the questions that was asked at that conference, that's a lot to put on a hospital doing all those screenings. Yeah. Um, and I know some of the answers were that they're trying to get one recognized screening tool that does housing, trauma, and, and kind of like, you know, Romella was saying that they're working on that will give a score on different things, but not so onerous. Is having to have an e I was an ER nurse for a while, so if you know anything new, you'd be going, nope, not going to do it unless they forced you to do it. So, I think for us, the most effective has been it, it, we we've had to put in additions, and again, we're studying kind of what's the most effective way to move forward, but the most uh, helpful way of getting that information has been person to person. Uh, let's see a show of hands in the room. How many people here are lawyers or have a legal background? Anybody? Uh, my name is Elizabeth Levy, and I'm an MBJ, and I've had previous experience doing medical legal partnership work at the UCLA School of Law, and I now run a, a medical legal advocacy uh, nonprofit, Physicians for Justice. It's a non, uh, non-profit network of uh, doctors who provide volunteer expertise to civil rights lawyers who represent homeless, indigent, undocumented clients. And throughout the presentations, I was listening for the words civil rights, incarceration, immigration, and I didn't, I didn't hear any of that. So I guess I'm wondering, I was sort of surprised, um, and I guess I'm wondering, do any of you have any current medical legal partnership programs? Right now, our organization is partnered with the Elder Line of Civil Rights Center here in Orange County. Um, Brooke Weissman, you may have no. um, and, uh, the, uh, and community legal aid. So Cal, we're working with the Washington Lawyers uh, Committee for Civil Rights in Washington, D.C. Do any of you have any programs where you work with lawyers who are representing the patients that you see in court? Well, we, we work with Brooke a lot just because of the, you know, Judge Carter got involved and they had that law case. So we We've had tons of meetings with um, both Brooke and Judge Carter, um, mostly on housing, uh, bringing individuals into our programs, because housing more than healthcare is a, is usually where you have problems that they won't allow people to stay if you have a mental health diagnosis, certain diagnosis. So we find that a lot. As far as immigration, it it doesn't have a bearing. Um, we. We actually, I think most of all of us, except, you know, don't ask, don't tell. And, and there are more, a lot of services that we can offer um, depending on, on immigration status. And we are a Medicare funded organization. So all our people are Medicare eligible and have Medicare. So we don't run into problems with those kind of things. Take care of all patients who come to seek care. Do you work with any lawyers or any partnerships with legal aid organizations in Orange County? You're talking about partnerships and meeting up to the profession. I'm just wondering if that is, it may not be, it may not be a part of the Are you asking me, so when a patient comes to the ER and they have an acute medical issue, we don't get into, to, I mean, there's a medical issue that we're dealing with. So we're not asking um, if they have any legal issues. I don't know how we would identify if the husband who lost his job that might be a legal issue. It okay. could be. I mean, that you know that was what I thought when I heard that. Yeah. I thought, well, why did we, you know what were the circumstances of that? Who might be somebody to talk to about that? That's a that for, for me that would trigger you know hearing like okay, what were the, what were those circumstances? Um, that's a that's a very interesting perspective. I can tell you on recuperative care, that's the really unique thing about recuperative care because we work with the UCI. They come to us. We actually have time to look at that yeah. Yeah. and work with legal aid, whereas in, in the hospital, a lot of times, they don't really have those services like we do. And I think that's the continuum that we're all trying to, to build. Um, I know the healthcare agency, we work a lot with their attorneys 
and and Brooke and their group. Okay, yeah, Norm. Yeah, I'm Norm Venn, uh, the residential group, and we do hospital, hospital doctors, medical group. Now, there are different mountains to farm in here, and I'm going to say the focus on the homeless, that is the highest value. There's no question about it. We have a tough time finding people on our benches to see them, so I hats off to the owners to come up with tactics. But I think also the scan, you're representing sort of a broader piece of a bell curve with these access challenge disadvantaged patients. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things we often face is the, uh, what I call it, the, the prodigal son that's come home and getting SSI and living off the paycheck and then doesn't want advanced directives in place because they lose their job. Um, that's a legal issue, but one of the frustrations we have all the time is APS is not much help. I hope I'm not offending anybody from APS here, but when you're looking for advocacy, there are very good solutions out there. I'm not, you know, it would be nice if social justice would solve that, but really, if you got an agency, you might want to know you're doing the job. And uh, we're going to have some tough times going ahead, plus the private sector is really a convergence model. Everybody has what we call a geocentric land grab. Just use my solution and you won't need anything else. The convergence is the future with a common platform. You still are playing an orchestra. Every song is a different orchestra when you get one of these cases. And you need a good conductor of that orchestra to aggregate resources. Uh, but I gotta tell you, that homeless problem is something we have looked at and my hat is totally off to you for figuring out a way to attack that and it's frustrated it, it It's so true because I, our, our staff's here and they do an incredible job. We have 200 employees. 39% of them are previously homeless, but it takes so much time with both adult and, and you know, we work with uh, SCAN. Also that, I, I don't know if people realize, you it, it, if you're in a hospital, it's really difficult to allocate that much time. You really need to listen to somebody with a mental health um, issue. Um, I mean, because they, they they just require a lot of time, and our medical system is not set up to do that. We're 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 working off, you know, some of the medical laws and some of the housing laws that were back in the 30s that we run up against. So um, that's that's a great point that it is a specific population. We've actually talked to Cal Optima about doing a carve out so we could um, spend more time, money, and all the the distinctive needs that you need for somebody that's homeless, because they have multiple um, issues, not just medical or social determinant. Some, some of our clients have all of them combined, and we are now seeing teens, we're seeing, you know, like I said, seniors, and it's everybody's like grouping them into one group and saying, oh, they're homeless, but it, it really is a different way you treat a teen and, and a senior. So we have about a minute left. I would love to get a last pearl of wisdom from each one of our panelists before we wrap up. We'll start with you, Paul. Okay. Um, no, I just thank you all for coming because, again, I don't think we could um, have enough of these rooms to talk about and try different ideas and to understand that Many times it's friends, family, and neighbors. We, we do a lot of presentations, and every time we do one, there's three or four people that come up and say, I have a son, I have a daughter, I have a mom who is homeless due to mental illness, substance abuse, and it, it really is a looming crisis that affects us all. So um, thank you for coming and spending time with us. David? I was just going to say there's a lot of activity in this space and things are moving very quickly at the federal level, the state level, the local level. So there's a good amount of reason for optimism. I think part of the challenge will be trying to integrate all these different strategies and programs and resources into something that's coherent that people can figure out and access. But I mean, there's a lot of efforts 
either underway or in the works. So it'll be a very interesting time. Hopefully those, these will start to make a big difference in the outcome soon. Yeah, thank you so much for your time this morning. I think the, the final thought for me is around partnerships, partnerships in thought, partnerships in action. Um, I think just in the small time that we had together this morning, um, we both heard about a number of different programs, but also heard a lot from you about what, what are some of the pain points and the challenges. And I think through partnerships, we can really help address those. So I look forward to um, continued conversations around this as we move forward together. Thank you. Perfect. So before I wrap up and thank the panelists, I would like to remind um, the business school is holding hosting two other events. One is the Healthcare Forecast Conference, which is in February. So great conference. We all attended. Perfect opportunity to continue the dialogue there, perhaps. And the second opportunity is around certificate and leadership for healthcare transformation. If you're interested, Diane is in the back. She'll be happy to give you more details. And with that, please help me in thanking our panelists, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>